it's great to say good morning oh i missed out last sunday it's great to be back to see your smiling faces and i want to see all your smiling faces so really fast show off your teeth go that's good that's good welcome everyone to williams if you're visiting this morning welcome again and we would love for you to fill out on the end of your pew a welcome form so we could have a record of your visit um but everyone grab your bulletins open them up there's a couple of things going on let me tell you about them super excited about this service this morning our texas mission team is going to give a, you a report on our week last week and um tonight there's going to be another report um, come back here at 6 o'clock. We'll be in the CMC, our gym. The youth are going to give their report on Passport, which was a couple of weeks ago. And then afterwards, there's going to be an ice cream social. Two great words, ice cream and social. Um, and what we're asking is that you bring your favorite ice cream or some sort of dessert, some sort of treat. Um, and we're going to have some Roma's chicken fingers and salad tonight. Just kind of say thank you to you guys. Um, but y'all come and enjoy that time with us youth. We're excited to tell you about our trip. And then also know that Wednesday, this coming Wednesday at 6.30, we will have our usual gathering, our Bible studies. So come, 6.30. And then one last thing, if you're interested in being a part of the golf tournament that we have yearly, it's going to be on August 8th. Um, and if you're interested, please see Mike Duncan. You have a form to fill out. But if you're not good at playing golf and you just want to sponsor a hole, there's a form to fill out for that as well. So you can see me or Mike, okay? All right, I've done enough talking. You need to find someone that you haven't seen this morning and said good morning to or you haven't hugged in a while or kissed on the cheek, okay? Find that person. Go. And thank you for doing that last week. Oh, you're welcome. No I always can count on you. It's like, oh, you're wrong. Isaiah 43 through 5. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Buenos dias. Uh, some of y'all are like, what? Yeah. No, TARDIS, that's a little bit later on. Is that, yeah, yeah. But I hope we ain't here that long. We might be. Uh, it's good to see all of you here uh, this morning for worship at Williams. I look out and I see all of you and I think, man, some people heard I wasn't preaching again and they decided to come to church. So uh, it is good to be back with you at Williams. I'm looking forward to uh, you hearing what we've uh, experienced uh, this past week, and just to be back with, with family and friends is always great, but it's even more so when we are in this place together for worship. So as we join together for worship, would you join me in a word of prayer? Great God, our Father, our friend, our Lord, and our Savior, Holy Spirit, Lord, as we've gathered this morning for worship, May we be mindful of our brothers and sisters who are also gathering for worship. Those who are gathering alongside us in buildings much like ours. 
those who are gathering in crowded, unair-conditioned spaces, those who gather under the threat, Lord, of their very lives. Make us mindful that the church is so much bigger than the box we try to keep it in. Make us mindful, Lord, of our brothers and sisters who gather to worship in different languages, in different ways, in different places. And Lord, as we worship this morning, may our offering of praise be pleasing to you. May you hear, Lord, our praise and our worship, and may we hear your voice speaking to us. Be with us now, Lord, with all of the burdens and joys that are on our hearts. Lord, be with us as we come to worship. In Christ's name, amen. All right, if you will stand and join with me, we're going to turn um, first to hymn number 303, People Need the Lord, and you, pro you may not need your hymn book on this one, um, but uh, if you'll stand, we're going to do the first and second verse, and then verse one again. Seven, send the light. We're going to sing the first, second, and last stanza.
thought Sharonda was coming. I was just, come on. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Some of us really are hard of hearing, like we can't hear real well. And so, I, like, they way back there, they don't think we're actually talking. So say, good morning! All right, did you guys hear me? Do you know how to say I want to teach you how to say it in Spanish, okay? Is that cool? You want to learn some Spanish? Can you say buenas? Can you say that? Can you say bean? That's a good way to start it. Buen you can't? Okay, that's okay. We, we'll learn Spanish later, and then we'll have to double up on Greek and Hebrew. Okay. Uh, well, let me ask you guys something. Did, did you get to pick your parents? No, right? You didn't, like, when you were born, like, the doctor didn't take you through the hospital and go, all right, which two of these people do you want, right? <coughs> that didn't happen, right? You were born to your parents. You didn't get to pick them. Nobody gets to pick their parents or their family or where they're born or where they live. And some people, when they're born, they're born into, like, really nice, and they have really nice parents. They have a lot of stuff. Do you guys have stuff? Like, in your rooms and... Like toys to play with and that kind of stuff, yeah? You got that? Yeah. Some people are, are born, they have a lot more stuff. Some people, when they're born, they don't have quite as much stuff. And there's always people who need things, children that are born to families. And we saw some of them. Can you guys see my shirt there? It says hearts. It, it should be like as wide as a billboard, as wide as I am. Hearts for kids, right? And these kids that were there, they, didn't, they weren't born with a lot of stuff. But all of us, most of us are born with a lot of stuff. And you know what that means? That doesn't mean we get to say, ooh, we get all this stuff and they don't and that's good. What God tells us is if you get a lot of stuff, if you're born and have a lot of privileges, what we call our stuff, God wants you to share that stuff. And that's what we got to do when we went to Texas this week, was we said, hey, here we are, we have all of, our, all of these things that we can do and there are people who can't do them, we're going to go help them do them because that's what God calls us to do. And there'll be people, there'll be kids in your class and stuff like that. They'll be the same way. And God wants you to share with them. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? Kind of deep stuff. Well, all right. Well, I want to pray with you. And then uh, we're going three and fours and there's no children's church. So let's pray together, okay? God, I thank you for these kids. I thank you for the way you always teach us through children. And Lord, I just pray that as we would see the things that we have and that you'll help us to share them, Lord. Help these kids to share with those around them and doing so to share the gospel and be examples for us adults. Lord, we pray uh, that you go with them the threes and fours be with us the rest of this time of worship. In your name, amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is um, 470, Footsteps of Jesus, and we will sing, stand and sing all four stanzas. So if you'd stand with me, we'll sing all four.
Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the many blessings that you've given us. Lord, for being able to go and do as, as you guide us to do, Lord. And I just pray that as we come to our, our church and come together as a church family, Lord, that we give back um, in all ways possible. Lord, that you guide us in, in what we do and where we go and, and what we give, Lord. We love you and we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the many blessings that you've given us and being able to share those blessings with others. In your name I pray. Amen. Now we're good. Oh, hey, there it is. Pardon our progress. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves for a few moments. good? Awesome. Well, um, 
This is all of us minus Allison, I think. Um, but just imagine her over here next to Mel. Um, and um, and uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, this morning just about where we were going and who are we helping. But before I do that, because I'm a preacher, I feel like I should read from the Bible. And that's always a good place to start. Now, I, I thought, what can you... I mean, there are all these passages, right, that come up about mission. Is it darker in here or is that me? I'm sorry. I'm a little distracted. Uh, um, and as I thought about um, what can you say, what do you think about missions, the Great Commission always comes to mind, the last words that Jesus left. But these words, I, I pick different ones because, as you all know, I'm a little different. Um, the words that always come to mind for me when I think about missions, when I think about service, are Jesus' words uh, in Matthew 26, which are apparently stuck together. And I can't find it. Oh, here it is, Matthew 25, sorry. Um, and Jesus is talking to his disciples, he's teaching, and this is what he says. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, when he will sit on the throne of his glory, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it? When was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then... Then he says, he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? He will answer, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. I think about that passage because, and I'm, I'm trying not to preach. Um, the first group, the righteous, did it without expecting anything. And the second group almost sound like, if we had known, we would have done it because then you would have given us something. And so we're going to be up here this morning talking to you about what we did and hoping that you'll want to come with us. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe because we want you to come and experience the blessings that we got, but also because this is what we're called to do, whether we get anything out of it or not. This is what we are called to do, and if we do what we're called to do, we can't help but get something out of it. And so um, that's the sermon for today. Um, but this is our trip, this is our team, and we were going with Hearts for Kids, uh, which is a, an organization that is a part of Together for Hope, which is the same organization uh, that Sowing Seeds for Hope in Perry County is a part of. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Uh, this is uh, George or Jorge Zapata. Uh, George is Superman. I mean, he can be in two places at once, I'm sure. Um, George is the guy I've been talking to for a while. Um, he is the director, sort of the coordinator of Hearts for Kids, and also the pastor of New Wine Church, uh, which is the church we attended on Sunday. And do you have a slide of the... Um, when we went to worship, it was kind of odd. We were expecting to hear George preach, but there was a guest uh, pastor from India who talked about the persecuted church. And I wish, I wish you could have been there to hear what he had to say, because... I, yeah, we, we, we think the word persecuted is cheap in America, and I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll get on a box I can't get off of. Um, but 
But this is George. Uh, he's the director of Farts for Kids. He was our main contact guy, helped set us up everything. And this guy here is uh, Pastor Roberto Blanco. He is the pastor of the church where we were helping, Eliasim, Eliasim Baptist Church uh, there in Brownsville. Uh, I mean, there, there's just, you can't say enough about George or even about Pat. We got to know uh, Roberto pretty well, those of us who were working construction. Uh, he was over there with us. You'll hear more about that. Uh, here in a minute. But Hearts for Kids is an organization that has started, uh, George's church has helped to start several other churches, and these are though uh, these churches. Uh, I don't know if you can tell really well in the picture, but they're all sort of this color. Like every one of them is painted this really bright sort of aqua color. And I asked George about that, and he said, well, really, we one church painted it that color, and they all picked out that color individually. And uh, I remember thinking, that's kind of kind of silly. That's not really a, a very serious color. But as soon as you pull into a colonia, as soon as you come down the road and you see that color, you know that's the church. So it's almost like a steeple, but just painted all over the building. And these are three of the other churches uh, that George has helped started, um, that his church has helped start. And this is the one we were working at here. Um, and again, you'll see and hear more about that later. So um, Hearts for Kids also um, does different things. They build beds for children. Uh, children don't have beds to sleep in in these places. They uh, help provide food, clothing, all sorts of things for the children in the valley. Six, I think it's six of the poorest counties in the country, or in the ten of the poorest counties are in the Rio Grande Valley uh, there in Texas. We were, um, most of our work was two to three miles from the border of Mexico and Texas. So. Um, you have another slide for that? Okay, so um, really, like I said, there's a lot to, you can ask us more about Hearts for Kids, look them up, they have a Facebook page. Uh, they do so much, George does so much in serving that community, and he does it all with like the biggest smile on his face, and he's never, you never get the sense that he is stressed out. You never feel like, oh gosh, I have to be here, I have to be here. He's always just chill, doing what he needs to do, and, um, and still looks really young for how old he is. I don't know. Um, he's got a gaggle of grandchildren. But anyway, um, well, up next, I think some folks are going to talk about where we stayed. So, um, We stayed in a place in Harlingen, Texas, called the Valley Baptist Mission Education Center. Uh, within that education center, um, Baptist children and family services uh, partners and rent space to provide homing for um, undocumented minors. The program is federally funded and they partner with border control. Um, it was kind of a topic when we got there, it was just kind of glanced over. We learned rules about how to interact with them, but we really didn't know much about them. You know, we learned if they're walking on the sidewalk, they always walk in groups of eight. So make sure you don't break their line of eight and make sure that, you know, they get to continue on to their path. And we learned, you know, if they're in the cafeteria, just wait till they get done and then you can go in. But it just gave me enough information to where my mind was just trying to figure out more about them and uh, we'd had three days at the center you know seeing them and seeing what their daily life was like before we had an opportunity to ask George about those boys um, the mission center only houses the boys the undocumented minors there uh, we were going to the border with George and it was a pretty long car ride so uh, we talked about Brownsville, and we talked about his ministry, Hearts for Kids, and then we had an opportunity to ask him about those refugees. Um, they stay at the center for about four to five months, just long enough for them to be processed to figure out where they came from. Uh, and then once a large enough group from that native country arrives, then they take a trip back to that country where they came from. And uh, George said that um, they, they're housed here till that can happen, but, um, you know, once they take that trip home, they go to a highly populated city within their native country. They do, are not taken back to their hometown. It'd be like if you were from Jacksonville and they took you to Montgomery. So they take you to a highly populated city and drop them off. Um, no water, no food, no phone call to their parents or relatives, and they're just kind of sent on their way. Um, 
within that populated city um, more times than not either gang or highly um, drug influence drug cartel target the uh, drop-off areas so those young men are given the option to either join that lifestyle or lose their life um, most of these kids George was telling about their parents have kind of paid for them to come to America because they have been threatened so they're just trying to make it to safety and escape the violence and corruption of their countries and a lot of them have left behind everything they've known, their families, just to make it to America to experience the safety and the opportunities and just to have a better life. And um, briefly, they get to see the resources that we as Americans can offer before they are sent back to that same violence that they were trying to escape. And um, it just really, it just lets you see that they are so much more than just undocumented children. They are part of our family of Christ, and we can't just ignore their needs because they have tried, they're trying so hard just to live and survive. And all week, God was flipping my perspective to show that, you know, news and media. They want to pump in this fear that these people are so dangerous and we need to keep them out and all this thing. But most of them are just trying to escape, you know, being killed. And he was flipping that sense of fear and instilling a sense of compassion that these are my family, these are my brothers and sisters, and we have to share and we have to help them. So that was all about them. and I are going to talk about um, VBS. Um, <clears throat> on Saturday after, after we arrived um, and unloaded, we all, I think, went to the work to the church. And then from there, George and Roberto took us to the uh, neighborhood that we would be con where we would be uh, conducting Bible school. And um, it was probably two to three miles from the church. We made that trip several times, but I, we never really measured it. But it wasn't far from the church that we were working at. And so on that Saturday evening, we just kind of drove through the neighborhood and uh, looked around. And we uh, found a, a vacant lot in the neighborhood where we wanted to set up to, to, buy, to do Bible school. And... Uh, George and Roberto stopped at a couple of places and talked to some people, kind of, I think, making it okay um, that, that we come to that, that location. And it was just a, as you can see, just a, a vacant lot. Um, so that was on Saturday. Um, the neighborhood uh, where we did Bible school was a lot different from the colonials that you'll hear about in a little bit. This was, it was basically like a, a trailer park, but these families had, a, they had nice homes, um, seemed to have food and clothing. They had their basic needs met, but um, there, there's no, the church in their area is just, just getting started. I think uh, Roberta's church told me, he told me it was four years old. He asked how old was our, our church, and I'm like, I don't know, 160-something, I think. I couldn't remember. He said, wow. <laughs> um, but his church is four years old, and they're, they're growing this church, and the, the point of us going and doing Bible school there was to help with, with that. So that was on Saturday. Sunday, we, uh, Sunday night we had a block party to try to get people in the community to come so we could tell them about the vacation Bible school that would be uh, happening uh, the next three evenings. We had Bible school in the evening starting at 7 until dark, which was between 8.30 and 9. And so Sunday night we went, we got there, and uh, George pulled this huge trailer behind him, and it had some uh, soccer goals made of PVC pipe and net, and we got the soccer goals out, and we had a, a, a parachute game that we played, and the girls did face painting, and we cooked hot dogs, and um, people in the community uh, 
we tried to spread the word. After we got there again Sunday night, we rode around and invited people to come, and then people saw us out there on the lot playing. So Sunday night was just sort of a kickoff night to get everybody interested in what was going on uh, <coughs> for the rest of the week. And we had a really good time that Sunday night. And then VBS started Monday night. And um, we had a really great VBS. Um, the, uh, we had several stories. Uh, the first night was about creation. The uh, second night was calming the storm, and the third night was feeding the 5,000. And um, I have to say, the younger, the younger women, they did all the planning for VBS, and they did a great job. There was a, a lot of animated telling of stories and um, props to use to help tell the stories and crafts to do. And uh, the kids really had a great time and enjoyed it. And the adults did too. The, uh, some of the parents came and they wanted to make a bracelet or do a coloring sheet or, <laughs> or wave the streamers during our songs and stuff. So we, um, we really had a good VBS and I have to give a thumbs up to the, the younger women who did all, all the planning and got it all together. Um. <clears throat> Like she said, um, there were a good many adults from the community that came to, to uh, the Bible school. And the first night, they um, listened to the story and did crafts with us. But then the second night, um, Sister Blanco, uh, Roberto's wife, uh, as soon as the, the Bible story ended, she gathered up all the grown-ups and took them over to the side and circled their chairs and um, she was able to share, oh, we have a, okay, yes, here they are. Um, she was able to share the plan of salvation um, with that group. And, um, and I think she had about four families that said that they would, um, wanted to attend church. So that was, that was a, a really good, a good thing, a good thing. And she was, um, uh, I really fell in love with her. <laughs> Um, but and then there, I just got to tell you about Queen right quick. There was this one adult. Uh, she didn't have any small children to bring to Bible school, but she lived across the street from right where we parked our trucks um, for Bible school, and uh, she she got more out of Bible school than anybody there. <laughs> Queen was a really unique uh, lady. She. Um, she did, the, she did the crafts with the kids, and she wanted everything that the kids got she wanted. Even at the end of Bible school, when um, the Kool-Aid was left over, she went to her home, got her uh, gallon pitchers, and took the Kool-Aid home with her. <laughs> and, but she, would, but not, she wasn't just take, take, take. She was uh, very giving. If we needed anything, I needed a lighter to um, start the fire that first night for, the, for our hot dogs. I went over to Queen's house and uh, got a lighter. Um, she, she let us put all of our garbage in her trash can. She was just as eager to give as she was to receive, and, and that, that it was, she was a really special lady. Um, is that all? I guess, I guess that's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> All of y'all come. I gotta hand this to somebody. <laughs> I am not a man. I'll hold it till they get up here. <clears throat> yeah, you don't get out that. I've already talked. Who wants to talk first? Oh, it can move. All from the mic. All right. Ty was supposed to talk. Uh, no, no, he wasn't. Um, one of y'all want to say something? No. I'll do most of the talking anyway. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people got to read books and uh, meditate a lot on our trip because we didn't have a lot of conversation, but it was a good quiet time. Um, you know, you could sit up here and talk about what we did, talk about all the stories, talk about all the events, all the people. But the thing that impressed me the most, I guess, was when we were leaving. Um, you know, uh, yeah, we 
we worked hard and we we waited long and anticipated a lot of things because we ran up again a lot against a lot of obstacles. But uh, um, at the end of the day, we accomplished the task that God sent us to do. And I don't know if you've ever um, seen the face of Jesus or not, but I did. And I didn't really know it at the time it happened, but just shortly thereafter, I knew that I did. And we had um, we sh we had devotions uh, every night after we got home, and that would usually start around nine or nine thirty. So the the sleep was few and far between, but uh, it was a great week. But um, when we were leaving, um, in fact, I didn't know for sure that it was Roberto's wife, but. You know, sometimes you give a token wave when you're leaving, um, just out of you know courtesy more than anything else. But when when I saw her and, and we made eye contact, uh, she was frantically uh, frantically rolling down her window. So I knew that it was more than a wave. And if you could have seen her face, the smile, the expression of love and joy that she had then you would have seen Jesus too. And, you know, had I not experienced anything else, that would have been worth it. You know, it's, I think it was, what was our last night? Thursday night. I shared a little bit of this uh, that night. <laughs> and I'm the world's worst. You know, we get a, we get a task to do something we think, all right, this is what we're going to do. It's sort of like that uh, Larry the Cable guy line, let's go get her done. <laughs> you know, you think you got all your ducks in a row, we're going to step out and just fly in and uh, just get out of the way. I shared in the last words that I said after the devotional Thursday night was, I've learned a valuable lesson. We went out there, uh, just to make it short, and I don't want to, may or may talk about it, but just to make this short, and you may hear uh, all the, Allison talked about barriers. We went out there thinking we're going to knock down the front door and do that building, but Christ said to us, no, just take your time. We're going in the back door this time. We're going, we're going, th these people, and this pastor, he needs some encouragement. Don't worry about the building. We'll get to it when it's time. That's the thing I took out. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. You go out to do a building project, and it really came down to relationships. It was more of a, the people we met, um, the people we saw. But, you know, the first couple days, we... We kind of got after it Saturday and Sunday and got way ahead of schedule, way ahead of the inspector, which was not a good thing. And then come Monday, everything came to a screeching halt when uh, the inspector informed us that we were at least a day ahead of him. And, um, but it did give us a chance to pull back, and we spent more time with Pastor Roberto. And just watching him for those couple of days, Monday and Tuesday, I mean, he was stressed to the max. He, you know phone and trying to call people and make things happen and and we were just stalled and he was feeling that frustration too he's got people that come from alabama to add on to his church and it wasn't happening you know we were there and and um and so he had the stress of us being there and the inspector not cooperating but it really gave us an opportunity to get to know him and his heart for his church his mission and uh and then the guys that would show up at night, you know, the people that had real jobs and went to work during the day uh, that attended church there would show up at night after their real job. And they'd work after we left. They'd keep on working until dark. And uh, so to me, it was not the fact that we got to swing some hammers or, or tote some wood. It was more that uh, we got to meet some brothers and sisters in Christ that, you know, different color skin and speak a little different than us. But the bottom line is... They're us, you know, they're really us. <coughs> you guys want to say anything? Well, as Mel said, uh, 
they were brothers and sisters in Christ, and it was very Baptist. Um, it, the Thursday, and it was about relationships, and I guess we'll just build on that. But uh, I think Thursday we were fed by the ladies in the church for lunch, and uh, they prepared a very good um, meal there for us. Am I stealing somebody's talk? Okay. <laughs> But uh, we were sitting around there looking, and uh, I knew they were Baptists when I looked on the back wall, and they had, they could have very well had our old board there with the attendance from last Sunday, the, uh, you know, tithe and offering listed, <laughs> and I just thought, you know, you only see, we well, sit in Methodist churches too, but Baptist, and uh, even on the sign that I, you may show later, you know, it's a Baptist church, and beautiful people. Um, now, maybe 50% of them could speak pretty good English, but some of them couldn't speak any English. Roberto didn't speak a lot, uh, usually had to have an interpreter. Um, but uh, it was, it, the church service, Chris didn't say too much about it, but the first church service we went to, you, he'd talk about every now and then they're going to shuck the corn or somebody's shucking the corn when they're preaching. And the guy from India really did. But the ladies in the church were really, really, literally shucking corn out in the entry before church. <laughs> I mean, quite a surprise, but just different cultures and different things that they're just used to, I guess. If we set tables up back there and was shucking corn and peeling it off the cob and handing it out to people coming in, you'd think that's really strange. But that was very natural to them, but they looked pretty good, too. <laughs> But it, it was it's quite a quite an experience. Uh, you'd be very proud you know, of the people that represented you. They did a good job, and you know, extended the hand of God to a lot of people. I like how everybody laughed because you know this is going to be really awkward. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't get the T-shirt memo, or I forgot. You can pick either one of those lies, <laughs> and uh, they'll both be true. Uh, I don't think any of us were really going to talk about the inspector, but I kind of need to to say what I want to say. Um, to borrow somebody's word, he was an ass. <coughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, when he finally gave us the green light, we talked about uh, Roberto Blanco, how uh, you know nervous he was and. That big smile they had on his face after he gave us the green light, that was, uh, I mean, that was more than enough. That was worth the 19 hours in silence with Al. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was just, it was, it was worth it. See how proud he, I mean, he was just happy that a bunch of uh, rednecks came down there to swing some hammers. <laughs> and it was, it was a good trip. I'll just say a couple of more things. Um, when uh, Nick mentioned the inspector, and we, um, there was a day we were waiting around and waiting on you know inspector to show up, and um, I got to ride in the car with Pastor Roberto on the way to the permit office, and it was just me and him, what Spanish I knew and what English he knew, and I remember uh, coming out of the permit office. We were walking, and he said, hermano, I need a Coca-Cola. <laughs> and uh, I said, let's go get a Coca-Cola, man. And uh, we were all sitting in the trailer for shade, and, and I was telling Wendell this the other night. If we had come in, like Wendell said, and we're just blowing and going, we'd have been done Tuesday afternoon, and what did we say, sitting on South Padre with our toes in the water or something. Um, and we would have never gotten to know the people there. We would have built them a building. They would have said thanks. And we would have come home, but uh, we were all sitting in the trailer eating some tacos from a place down the road. And uh, we asked Roberto, we said, hey, do you want to talk? He said, no, I'm going to go home. And he said, well, give me one. And he sat there with us, and we got to know him. And then uh, we were giggling a minute ago. When we had lunch on Thursday, Carrie, uh, every time she ate something, this is the best rice I've ever had. These are the best beans I have ever had. This is the best Sprite I have ever had. <laughs> and, uh, and I told her, I said, you know, that's probably the truth because that Sprite may have actually been the blood of Christ 
And those flautas may have actually been his body, and we may have actually not been eating lunch, but sharing in communion uh, with our sisters and brothers. And so, um, yeah, we had a lot of fun uh, at construction and said a lot of things I thought we couldn't say at church. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then we swapped nicknames, we swapped sayings. Uh, there is uh, El Hombre con Grande Sombrero, uh, or Wendell. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, we, we, uh, we had a lot of fun uh, doing construction, and we've uh, said some other stuff about that. So who's up next? Carrie. Oh, <laughs> this is the best microphone you will ever have. <laughs> um, okay, we got there initially, and we were going to, in the mornings, go play with the children that we were doing Bible school with. We had been warned about Hispanic time. End quote. <laughs> and Taylor actually thought it was legit. Hispanic time was different from any other time. But we learned quickly about Hispanic time. They, it's different than our time. So we got there at 9 o'clock, rode around, no one in sight. No one there to play with, play soccer with, anything. So we found out later that apparently they didn't wake up till about 11 or 12, which we were going to be gone by then. So. We found a place, this place called the Way of the Cross, and the guy that's in charge is named Ben, and I, if, I might be wrong, but quote, you know, fix it if I'm not. So I think he went on a trip to Nicaragua, and he came and he realized the needs that were there, so he moved to Harlingen and opened this warehouse, and Walmart is their biggest distributor, They'll, and they only distribute to like him in another facility that's not Walmart. Um, they have name brand stuff that come in. You have to repackage it and package it into small bags, which is what we did. Like here's some rice and we just kind of scooped it into a bag and put some M&Ms in it. And we were told that that was going to go to Central America. So the first day, that's what we did. We bagged rice and another group that was actually staying where we were, they were bagging beans. And so the second day we get there and we're bagging more beans. And he said, well, let's go get in the line and we're going to do an assembly of like, kind of like how we do blessing bags. We all get in line and we just throw stuff in a bag. So that's what we did. Here's Allison doing the bag. There's a bunch of like canned foods. There's the rice and beans, the cereal that we packed. Um, I think that was like baby food. Um, salsa, clothing, a toy was put in there, Kit Kat bars, things like that. And... Um, we, the first day, made over, I think on the second day that we did bags, too, we made about 300 bags. And they were going to the colonias, which you're going to be told about, and some were going to be sent over to Central America as well. But the last day, they did the bags for the colonias as well, because the other group that was with us, they were going to do Bible school at those colonias. Not the one that we were at, but the other ones that you'll be spoken to about. And I think that's really it. Anything missed? Okay, good deal. Okay, so you've heard the word colonia mentioned a few times. Um, and I think Chris mentioned that 10 of the poorest counties in the country were down there at the border. Um, I think it was on Wednesday. We went to the poorest um, county in the country, and we got to see um, what real poverty looks like in our country. Um, and... A col the colonia is basically where a developer has come in and he's, you know, paved the roads and um, there's a lot of lots available um, and they sell a half acre lot. The To get one, a family just has to pay $500 down and then the lot itself is costing twenty to $30,000 and they have 14% interest paid over 30 years. So at that point, if you, if anyone actually makes it to that um, 30 years, they will have paid 171, at least 171,000 for a lot that's worth $20,000. And not really anybody ever makes it that far. If you miss one or two payments, the landowner kicks you off the property and then the cycle starts over. Um, they get somebody else and it just keeps going. Um, we saw a lot of people living in travel trailers like in that picture a lot of um, half houses, like literally a house looked like it had just been cut in half, where they would build half of a house, and then they would, 
you know, try to work, try to get some more money and keep going. Um, like this house here, um, George said that they got that much built. By the time they get money to do anything else, that will be no good and they will have to tear it down and start completely over. Um, and so Taylor's gonna tell you some more. Um, like Sally said, we went to the Colonias on um, Wednesday and it was a very poor area and um, we saw like the living situations those people were in and like she said there's pl there were some places where they couldn't afford to finish their house so there were some houses that was just half of a house and the side of it was flat because they couldn't afford to finish it. Um, a lot of them didn't have electricity or air. Some had window units but you know here if we get hot we go inside and we sit down to cool off but there if they got hot they would leave their homes and go outside to cool down. Um, a lot of them had their kitchen area, like what we would call a kitchen area, was outside. They would have a fridge sitting outside, so whenever they wanted something, they would go outside to the refrigerator. Um, and it was just very small houses, and like Sally said, there were trailers. I know one of them, were, or like campers, one of them was that we saw, it didn't have a roof, so they had like made their own roof sort of on top of like a camper. Um, it was just really sad seeing like the areas they lived in but they I mean they thought they were living the American dream you know they had their land and stuff and then we went and delivered one day the bags that Carrie talked about to them and um, what we would do we went with George and um, he would come through and we would honk the horn and they knew we were coming so they would come outside and we would give them their bags and they were definitely grateful for that and um, we would give the kids M&Ms so we have some videos of us delivering. And we had, we would ride on the back of the trailer and we had like the stacks of the bags and this was some of the people we saw and delivered to. Well, um, there's no way we could tell you everything that we did or experienced on this trip. Um, in fact, I've already, already forgotten stuff from when I was sitting down to when I was going to stand up to tell you. Um, the uh, colonias you see there, those are, are not like you got to drive a far away to find them. I mean, they're everywhere. Uh, they are, I mean, I, I put them on par with predatory lending, really, to be honest with you, uh, in the way that they treat people who are trying to work hard and trying to be uh, just good citizens and good people, good Christians. Um, the church where we worked, um, Patsy had mentioned this, it's only been going for about four years, and in the car ride with uh, Pastor Blanco, uh, he asked, he said, so your First Baptist Church? I said, yeah. He said, oh, big problems. Big pro First Baptist Church, big problems. I said, no, they're the same size problems. And uh, he said, told me about his church and told him that we had been a church for 165 years, which blew his mind. And their church started with seven in the living room. And the building that we were building onto, uh, George, uh, is, is sort of a kind of a bishop, if I can, or a shepherd to sort of all of these pastors. And he called uh, Roberto one day and said, hey, I have a building for you. Do you want it? And he just couldn't understand that. What do you mean you have a building for me? He said, yeah, it's free. If you want this building, you can have it. And a church was moving out of their building. It's kind of the, the vision of all of these churches is they will start in these little green buildings until they grow out of them, and then they will give that building to another church that starts in another area. Uh, where Pastor uh, Roberto's church is, the church where we're working, uh, there are five colonias and seven communities all together. Two of them are middle-class sort of subdivisions, and no church presence. Uh, and that's what's happening in the, in the valley is it's growing so fast uh, it's going to be like, like Huntsville, how it kind of blew up when NASA moved there. Uh, SpaceX is moving to the Rio Grande Valley, and they're anticipating that it's going to blow up the population, and it already is. And so they're trying to just keep up with planting churches where people are. And uh, today, uh, this morning, I think Roberto will have about 50 to 60 people gathered in his sanctuary for worship uh, this morning. And that's, that's a huge, huge deal. Um, some of these pictures you see here just kind of capture some of the 
uh, fun we were having. I think one of the things that I loved about our, our time there, and this is a picture of all of us uh, outside after we had communion, after we had lunch with everyone. Uh, this is a sign that Nikki, that we had a, just a spare piece of plywood, and Nikki said, I want to make them a sign. And so, I mean, Nikki's, a, you know, she's an artist or something. And so um, Nikki uh, made this sign for them, and I think they were shocked. They didn't know what to do when, we, when Nikki presented them with the sign, because they were like, oh, okay. Uh, but they were re- I think they were really excited to have, like, we can, this is our church and our church building. And um, it really was just a, a, a great time for us. Um, not just, I mean, if, if you just took it as it was, you'd say that wasn't fun. I mean, if we were honest. It wasn't sitting in a car for that long, standing out in the hot sun, waiting on people. Uh, one of the reasons the inspector was an issue is because every inspection costs $75. Every reinspection costs $75. And they can fine you up to $2,500 if you don't do what they say. And they always find something. Georgia told us the reason that his church had moved was they had uh, waited for, they had changed their floor plan for 10, uh, 10 times and finally decided it was easier to move to another zone than to have the inspector come. Um, the same was true here, moving this building to where it is, they tried to play the ask forgiveness, not permission game, and it kind of went uh, pretty rough for them there. For, for four months, uh, Pastor Roberto drove back and forth to the permit office, just trying to get them to okay it. It's a little bit of a, a corrupted uh, system there, but um, we, we just um, had a, 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 I don't know, it's always eye-opening when you're with brothers and sisters who you don't see all the time. And you know that whether or not we ever make it back to the Rio Grande Valley, which we are, we're going next summer. Y'all come with us. Um, and I mean that. Like, you're going to hear about when we're going. In fact, we're going to, we have some things in the works that we're going to be doing throughout the year uh, at our partner sh- church here in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, specifically around Christmas time and some other things you'll hear. Um, but you know if you don't make it back, you'll see them again. And there's something great about that. And... Um, this is Pastor Roberto after. I mean, really, it was before. I, I, I remember him. He, he has a giant blue phone. And I remember he just threw it. Like, he was so frustrated. He was so, so just, de- and he was more worried about us. He wasn't worried about his building. He was worried about us. He was, he was hoping that we weren't being upset, uh, waiting around for an inspector to come. And um, someone made the comment to me this morning. I think it may have been Eva that uh, when, when we get together, sometimes it seems miraculous what we can do. Uh, I felt like we did a week's worth of work in maybe two days, uh, at least at the construction site and some other things. So um, I'm going to ask if the whole team would just come stand up here in the front. And if anybody has anything they want to add, um, now's the time to do it. So. And we're missing Ty and Jill, and since they're not here, we get to talk about them. Um, no, they were they were Ty, Jill. They were um, we didn't know this till last night. He was working through a kidney stone, and uh, just uh, I mean, you all know uh, Ty and Jill. Just awesome. Jill was working through uh, seven staples in her head uh, that we joked that Ty put them there, but a ladder had blown off in the wind and caught Jill just right on the head. And seven staples later, she was back out there with us. Uh, with just the best attitude and uh, going wide open. So, anybody have anything they want to add? I'd like to thank the, the church congregation. Just thank y'all for your support and your prayers because we could certainly feel them. Anybody have anything? I know Wendell's gets. Yo, know, Nikki, you want to say something? Mm-hmm. That Wendell's going to go last. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, I was always excited to get in the car with Jorge or George um, because he always had really interesting stories. He would tell us about the community and about what was over the border, what was going on. And he told us so many things that, you know, you you can't forget. But one thing that I wanted to bring back home, and, you know, Allie kind of said the same thing, was that he had a lot of groups come in and um, they were afraid. And he would ask us, how do you feel here near the border? Do you feel safe? Well, yeah, of course. Um, There's no violence, is there? 
no, there's not. And he said, well, the, the news will tell you different. That's a lie. It, it's safe here. Um, and he said, there's a lot of groups that, that won't come and help because they're afraid. There's many people that don't want to help the poor because they're afraid. And it is so true that when there is fear, it is hard to find love. There's so many people in this community and outside of our community that need our help. We cannot be afraid. There's so many people that need love. Don't be afraid of them. That's all I had to say. Preach. Anybody down that one? Wendell has something. Uh, it's not that I'm up here wanting to grandstand and say, oh, leg, all this and that, but I'm, uh, I just felt like that the uh, Lord wanted me to talk about this, I wrote down two or three pages here, and I'm going to read. And I'm going to tell you what, because I can't remember it all to be able to uh, call it back. But it really doesn't have anything to do with us or those people that you see up there. It has to do with what draw those people and these people together, and that's Jesus Christ. Because, you know, uh, a lot of times when we get back, I love to hear the stories, and I'm, I'm sure Nikki's got one of them picture things with uh, music. That was well, she don't have one. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, if we do have one, they, they're fun. Uh, Jim and Jim Justice and some more people that's been, been in this region right here will know what I'm talking about. What I once, what I thought was a des, we were going to a desolate place, you know, not a lot of grass, rocks, you know, just not a whole lot there. What I found out was, uh, on the way there, and when we got there, the ground made the ground as hard as a rock. It is extremely hard to dig in. You you would think, man, it's You'd have to toil and labor a lot to get fruit from a seed out of a ground like that. But if you've been there and you see it, it's probably, well, I don't say probably, it's the most fertile land I've ever been dri driven through on both sides of the road. Crops and grain as far as you can see. In a place where you thought nothing could grow out of. That's, at least that's what I thought, and I bet half of y'all in here. So that was kind of the what I had going on in my head. It won't take long. <laughs> and I, I said I'll say this. Uh, uh, had a birthday the day we went out there. I'm fixed 56 years old. So if, if a 56 year old man's voice cracks or he might uh, drop a few tears on this paper, then I don't care. What do we say and share after arriving back home from a mission trip? I could say and talk about the poverty and lack of resources, and it would be true. I could talk about language and culture barriers, and it would be true. I could talk about how our resources and time helped a group of people ease their hardships, and it would be true. But today I'll talk, talk about not just some folks living on a border town, but my and your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. See, we're all the same. We're all equal in the eyes of Christ. The things I just mentioned about resources and barriers take second fiddle when brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus get, to get together share meals and fellowship together, share love, laughs, tears of joy together, for there's no room for sorrow. It drifts away. We seem surprised, but we shouldn't be. For Christ himself said, put others' joy above your own. Now I might have worded that statement my way, 
but that's what he means. Let it go. I assure all, I assure you all will be all right. Lastly, after riding and having what we call windshield time, over 40 hours worth, you get to see a lot. And you get to see a lot of people and see just a glimpse or a small slice of how big God's world really is. You get, to, you get some time to think about what's really important, what really lasts, what matters most. For myself and I hope for you, for you all, know that this world isn't as bad as we might make it out to be. That all's not lost. That it can't be saved. That's not true. The body of Jesus Christ is alive and well. Acts of kindness and love are all around us. We just have to notice them. Is it true there's evil in this world? The answer is yes. But don't let it rob us. I forgot to get my Bible. I want to read one passage of Scripture, and then I'm about finished here. I'm going to read out Mark chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. I didn't tell Chris. Me and him stayed in the room that night when we were coming back from a... We was in Picayune. He was in the shower. Of all things, I didn't feel like digging this Bible out, so I opened that drawer and that Gideon Bible was in there. But the words of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of other things come in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. Others like seed down on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. After reading it, my eyes and more my heart welled up. I'm convinced the soil of this land and the world is still rich and fertile, just like all those fields of grain, as far as the eye could see along the Rio Grande Valley. Truly I say, Jesus Christ is alive and well. Sometimes it just takes a little windshield time to notice it. To Christ all glory. Amen. Sometimes it feels like I shouldn't be in the pulpit, but just standing out here. Um, we're, we're not going to have an invitation. I want you to see what song it is uh, and just hum those words to yourself and remember what you've heard here this morning. And my final word to you is this. You've heard what we've said. You've seen what we've shown. And perhaps Christ has spoken to you. And now, next time, you'll go where we've been and go where we're going to go. Uh, this wasn't a one-time trip. We've made at least a five-year commitment with Pastor Blanco and his church. And so I hope you'll go with us. Uh, you've had a heads up now, so go ahead and start shuffling around time. Uh, come go with us. Have some of that windshield time. Have some of that time to let the Lord speak to you. Have some time to let go of those fears that you might have had and going somewhere else. Let go of, of whatever it is that makes you think this is the only place you need to be and this is the only place where we need to do something. There are things to do here and we're going to do them. But Christ calls us to go and do things in other places with other friends, with other brothers and sisters. He's calling you to do it too. So come on go with us. Come on and go with us next time and see what we've seen. See the face of Christ and the pastor's wife you have never met. Hear the voice of God speaking to you as you're sitting around waiting on an inspector. See that it's all not bad as you stare out the windshield at the grain that goes on forever and ever 
and ever. And share communion around corn tortillas and Mexican table cream. See what we've seen, hear what we've heard, and come on and go with us. Will you stand as we pray and dismiss this morning? Lord God, we are so thankful for the commission that you've given us. Thankful for this church, Lord, and its obedience to answer your call. Lord, I'm thankful for these who stand here this morning who've gone, who've answered the call this time. Lord, for the stories that they've shared, the stories that they will forever share for as long as they walk this earth. And Lord, we pray for our friends and in the Rio Grande Valley, for George, for Hearts for Kids, for New Wine Church. We pray for Elasim Baptist Church and Pastor Blanco and his family. God, we pray that as we support them, that they teach and show us Lord, more ways that your kingdom is growing and more ways to be your hands and feet and to answer not only the great commission to go and make disciples, but that commandment that is above all other commandments to love God and our neighbors wherever they may be as ourselves. Go with us from this place, Lord. May we take the name of Jesus with us, take the stories we've heard. May they encourage us to go and see, to go and do, to go and be.